is the Holistic Living Session. Um, I'm proud to introduce the moderator, Hilary Garivaltis, uh, who's going to be moderating the session. Uh, Hilary uh, serves as the current Executive Director of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association and is a former, uh, founder and former dean of the Kripalu School of Ayurveda. Uh, she received her initial training in 97-98 from the New England Institute of Ayurvedic Medicine and continued with advanced training in the U.S. as well as in India between 2000 and 2007. She continues to study with the world's leading teachers in the U.S. and in India whenever she gets a chance. So, Helen, um, take it away. Thank you. Thank you all. And let's give a round of applause to our wonderful panel. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Sanjay and Jai and VHPA for uh, putting this wonderful panel together and, and asking me to lead the panel for today. It's, it's a privilege and an honor. You know, my path is focused on holistic living and Ayurveda very specifically as the, as the director of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. So this is dear and near to my heart and I'm very excited to listen to all of our speakers as, as you all are today. I just want to read you a little bit about this particular panel, and this panel's a little different than the panels we've seen this morning in that we're each going to present um, uh, our own talk, and then we will have some uh, questions uh, that I'll pose, and hopefully questions from the audience as well. A uh, very unique and diverse group of speakers in the field of holistic living and, and wellness. So holistic is the realization that individual parts are deeply interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. As such, Mother Nature has always intended that we live in harmony and peace and do what is best for our mind, body, and self. Making a conscious effort towards self-improvement is a small step to a better life and in turn, the world. It means taking care of and nurturing our well-being, restoring the mind, body, and self to a balanced state of energy, living our life in a way that is both natural to us and the world in which we live. A holistic lifestyle benefits us physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Watching our diet, keep our mind and body active through the practice of yoga and meditation, but that's not all of what is involved with holistic lifestyle. On a physical level, it's about learning to listen to our bodies. On an emotional level, it's about keeping a positive mind frame, letting go of the negative energies, and using our energies towards things that add value to our life. On a mental level, it's about embracing the fact that each one of us is unique. On a spiritual level, it's about spending time in nature and finding a deeper connection within ourselves. Consistency, regularity, and self-discipline is key in living a holistic lifestyle and keeping a positive outlook and attitude. Uh, so I want to, uh, I, I just want to begin and just give a, a quick uh, background of myself and my organization to just get that, you know, up and out of the way. And then I want to introduce our, our featured speaker, um, Dr. Rothenberg. Um, the, uh, I, I represent the National Ayurvedic Medical Association, which is uh, an association that um, is, is trying to establish Ayurveda, our, our dear science, um, in the West and specifically in the United States. And we've been at this for about 20 years. And so we are here to bring this Vedic knowledge to uh, a country and uh, a world that desperately needs it, and what if we can establish it well in the United States, it's going to set a precedence, you know, worldwide. Um, so we were the work that we're doing is really important, and I encourage you all to um, learn more and be engaged, you know, with us in the process. Um, so I want to introduce our our speakers um, uh, for uh, the day, and then we'll. Um, begin our, our, our talks. Our first uh, speaker will be Dr. Stuart Rothenberg. Uh, and he's a National Medical Director of the Transcendental Meditation Health Professionals Association and Maharishi Ayurveda Association of America, a fellow of the American Academy of Family Physicians, 
He was a Pulitzer uh, Scholar at Columbia College in New York and received his MD degree from the New York University School of Medicine. He completed his postgraduate training in family medicine at the University of Rochester. Dr. Rothenberg was one of the first physicians in the U.S. to be trained as a teacher of transcendental meditation technique and to receive training in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, he co-founded the first physician directed Maharishi Ayurveda Medical Centers in the United States, specializing in treatment and prevention of chronic disease using an integrative mind-body approach that includes Ayurvedic medicine and transcendental meditation. And he'll be up in a moment to, to share. And then we have Sri Dinesh Akashkar Yogacharya the, with the Art of Living. Um, he's, he's graduated in, as a chemical engineer from IIT in Mumbai. Uh, he's considered a subject matter expert in the field of yoga and pranayama, conducting art of living programs for huge gatherings in India and countries like Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Mauritius, Germany, Switzerland, Poland, Russia, <laughs> Mongolia. <laughs> goes on and on. His programs have benefited more than half a million people. Uh, he's in charge of the Sri Veda uh, Agama Sanskruta Mahapratisha, a heritage school started by the Art of Living. Uh, so, welcome to, to Sri Kashikar. And then we have Dr. Silesh Rao. He's the founder and executive director of Climate Healers. Uh, Dr. Rao is the founder and executive director, a nonprofit dedicated towards healing the Earth's climate. Uh, assistant specialist and a PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. Dr. Rao worked on the internet communications infrastructure for 20 years after graduation. In 2006, he switched careers and became deeply immersed full-time in solving the environmental crisis affecting humanity. Dr. Rao is the author of two books, Carbon Dharma, The Occupation of Butterflies and Carbon, Yo Carbon uh, Yoga the vegan metamorphosis, and an executive producer of four documentaries, Dr. Rao's a human, earth, and animal liberation activist, husband, dad, and since 2010, a starstruck grandfather. Um, he's promised his granddaughter, Kamaya, that the world will be largely vegan before she turns 16 in 2026. So, welcome. And then we have Dr. Angelina Mehta, uh, she's a naturopathic physician, uh, is licensed in naturopathy. Um, she graduated from uh, Chapman University, Kumbhadi, in 2005 and Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine in 2010. She's extensive training in women's and men's medicine, endocrinology, and acupuncture, and has furthered her knowledge in homeopathy, botanical, and environmental medicine. Dr. Meda has also taught and spoken about naturopathic medicine within the community. Her 15 years of military experience helped um, uh, uh, develop exceptional leadership and teaching skills, and her undergraduate studies imparted to a greater understanding of the law, policies, government function, and sociology. So welcome to Angelina and our whole crew. So I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Rothenberg to begin our series of talks this afternoon. speaking at medical conferences where we got a lot of slides. So I'm kind of in that habit. Hope that'll be okay. So, um, so far I found this conference so completely inspiring. I felt absolutely blown away. I'm very humbled to be following all the speakers who have preceded me. Uh, starting last night with that beautiful talk by Rajiv Malhotra, and the part that I loved, and someone earlier commented and it seemed it was a little controversial, but I just thought it was really very apt, where he described the different uh, categories of uh, people of Hindu tradition in America and uh, the, the different ways that they might make their contribution from people who are kind of in the closet and uh, doing this surreptitiously, uh, those who are more out front and those who are very bold and out front and so forth. But I thought there's yet another category that might be introduced and that's people like me, who aren't from the Hindu tradition, but who were deeply inspired by it, in my case, from a very young age. 
and who made it uh, part of their, made it really their life's work to advance these principles and these concepts within mainstream American life. Um, in the spring of 1968, I was a senior at Columbia in a classroom, uh, in an elective course I was taking on Eastern religion. And the professor, who was not at all uh, of Indian origin, she was German, she uh, wrote on the board, as I remember writing in those days, I wrote on the board, um, and she was writing uh, these famous aphorisms from the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, and I said, why hadn't I ever heard these before? And I thought, this is obviously the truth of life. It just dawned on me. It was one of these, you know, aha experiences. And uh, I knew then that I wanted this to be a centerpiece, the centerpiece of my, of my life. And I found ways to integrate it into medicine when I went on to medical school and so forth, which I'll tell you about more as we go on. So holistic living, the Vedic ideal of healthy life. Next slide. Um, holistic living, there are so many ways to, uh, to explain it, but we could say it is, includes balance of four levels, mind, body, behavior, and environment. I'm going to come back to these four levels as we go on. The Vedic tradition of India, which includes yoga, meditation, or Ayurveda, provides a wealth of practical wisdom, highly relevant to maintaining health and balance in today's busy, stressful world. I think one of the most inspiring things and rewarding things for me as a physician has been working with these most ancient principles and concepts and finding that they actually provide the solution to the most pressing problems of modern health and modern life. One of the things I learned early on from my teachers was this beautiful tradition, Vedic tradition, of paying respect for the teachers and honoring the teachers, and we've seen that so many times today, honoring the guru. I wanted to honor at the outset my two principal teachers, there have been others, but particularly Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and Rajvaj Vriyaspati De Triguna. Maharishi was the founder of the Transcendental Meditation Technique and Maharishi Ayurveda, responsible for promulgating meditation on Ayurveda throughout the world. I'm sorry, next slide. I think you should remember that I'm not controlling this from here. So, um, so Maharishi, founder of TM and Maharishi Ayurveda, and really um, a major driving force in bringing meditation and Ayurveda to the West and all around the world. And Rajvaja Vyaspati Dev Tribuna was a disciple of Maharishi. He was former president of the All India Ayurveda Congress and honorary physician to the president of India. And it was so fulfilling for me that on August 30th of this year, Prime Minister Modi selected these two as two out of 12 master healers of India uh, to be honored by the government of India with their own postage stamp, commemorative postage stamp, which is actually what's pictured here. So I think if we're talking about um, holistic living, then we need to start with the Vedic concept of wholeness. What is holistic? So this is what blew me away when I was sitting in that classroom, was this idea of wholeness. This was literally the sloka that she wrote on the board that day, that term, the professor that clicked with me. I am Atma Brahm. The self is Raman, the wholeness of life. I said, okay, self, my inner self, is identical with the totality of the universe. So that's something worth going delving into. And then another one, there are so many, but this one was specially cited in Ayurveda. Yata Pinde, Tata Brahmande. As is the atom, so is the universe. As is the body, so is the cosmic body. So I think these um, these are not fanciful philosophical statements. This is, this is the reality, and it's ingrained in the physiology, in the human physiology, in so many ways. And when we have that as our vision, as our uh, structure, our framework, then it makes us so much more effective as practitioners, health practitioners. The three areas that I was asked to briefly cover and to introduce, to pave the way for the other speakers, yoga, meditation, and Ayurveda. So in yoga, I thought, let's look and see what the government of India, how, how it defines yoga. We have this wonderful ministry now, the Ministry of Ayush, Ayurveda, yoga, etc. So Ayush defines yoga as a discipline to improve or develop one's inherent, inherent power in a balanced manner. It offers the means to attain complete self-realization. 
Yoga can be defined as a means of uniting the individual spirit with the universal spirit of God. And I thought that was so great that the ministry of, yoga, of, of Ayush does not shrink from discussing yoga in terms of asana postures or whatever, but really has this authentic Vedic vision of what yoga is, is their official definition. Here are some other traditional definitions from the classical text, from the Yoga Sutra, chapter 2, yoga chitta vritti narodha, meaning yoga is the least excited state of the mind. And from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, I'm sorry, that, uh, Yoga Sutra is chapter 1, Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, samadvam yoga uchyate, balance of mind, is called yoga. And a few verses later, yoga, kamasu kaushalam, yoga is skill in action. So, so many levels of yoga from very internal, least excited state, a little bit more expressed, balance of mind, and then most expressed in the field of action, how it affects our action, balance of action. Yoga, uh, in the Yoga Sutra, Maharshi Patanjali describes Ashtanga Yoga, that there are eight limbs of yoga, tremendous, if we want to talk about holistic living, we, we need look no further than the Ashtanga Yoga, the Yoga Sutras. It includes behavioral prescriptions, exercise, the physical postures that have become so popular, asana, pranayama, breathing exercise, and mental practices, particularly meditation. Yoga in the US has become enormously popular. One in seven Americans have practiced yoga within the past year, and these numbers have been increasing steadily from 2007 to the present. And the National Institutes of Health, National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, reports scientific documentation for the benefits of yoga in the following areas. And they're very rigorous. When they do these reviews, the NIH Center is very rigorous in what they would include as credible research. But they stand behind this research on yoga in the area of stress management, mental and emotional health, healthy eating and lifestyle habits. Yoga improves sleep and physical balance. It's been shown to improve menopausal symptoms. It improves pain management, provides assistance for weight reduction, smoking cessation, and reduces fatigue and improves quality of life in chronic disease patients. Of course, that each one of these could be a subject of its whole enormous talk or even a course, but I'm just, I'm just going through this as a way of introducing the whole subject. Out of yoga, we know in the Yoga Sutra, the last of the, of the eight limbs of yoga is samadhi. Samadhi is transcending, transcendental consciousness, unbounded awareness within. One of the great gifts that Maharshi gave to the world was to show that that is easy to achieve. It is not something that is difficult. It doesn't require asceticism. It can be, it's easily learned by anybody in any walk of life. And the system called transcendental meditation directly derives from the Yoga Sutra. It um, was maintained in, for thousands of years in the Shankaracharya tradition of India. Maharshi brought it to the West in the late 1950s, encouraged its scientific exploration. And so when I was a medical student at NYU, these studies were first coming out in science, American Journal of Physiology, Scientific American, which has played a big role in my interest in learning transcendental meditation. Starting from those first three studies, the research literature has grown tremendously. There are now 420, or over 420, peer-reviewed published studies on TM to date. The NIH has granted research grants for over two, uh, $28 million. So TM um, is a mechanics that is natural to the system, and what happens in TM is what's called transcending. The mind naturally settles down, goes beyond thought, beyond the gross thinking level, and progressively to more subtle, more subtle, more subtle states of thought, ultimately transcends thought altogether and experiences that state of inner consciousness, unbounded awareness, which is called samadhi in the Yoga Sutra. So it does not involve concentration, it does not require effort or, um, or focused attention, it doesn't involve contemplation, it doesn't involve mindfulness. It's, uh, and this is one thing that I find very useful in my medical practice, that this practice is very easily added to the daily routine, even for very busy people. It doesn't require any change of mindset or lifestyle, and it is completely um, without any particular religious affiliation. Though, of course, we recognize that all of these practices are coming 
from the ancient Vedic tradition of India, but they're universally applicable for, applicable for people of all walks of life. And it's taught in the traditional manner by trained teachers in a one-to-one one -one instruction by the teacher to the student. Some of the research results on transcendental meditation, a wide range of health benefits, including improved mem memory and cognitive, cognitive function, reduced stress, anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Some of these others, I'm, I'm going to pull out two slides to show in a moment. But rather than just read through the whole list, if you're interested in learning more about the research or anything else about TM, I would refer you to the website at the bottom, which is www.tm.org. But two studies I wanted to mention that have received widespread publicity. And several years ago, the American Heart Association released a scientific statement. They reviewed all the scientific studies on meditation and mental relaxation techniques on blood pressure. And they found that transcendental meditation reduces blood pressure. They said that TM may con be considered in clinical practice to lower blood pressure. So this was publicized throughout the medical profession at the time, they did not find that for any other form of meditation or any other mental technique that has had scientific research in the area of blood pressure. And this study, which was one of the NIH-supported studies done at Medical Con College of Wisconsin, this is a randomized controlled trial of, um, of individuals uh, who had known coronary heart disease, uh, and were followed over a period of five years. And the group that had been randomized to learn transcendental meditation uh, had, was found to have a 48% reduction in death, heart attack, and stroke compared to the controls. So this is a very strong evidence that the mind has a powerful effect on the body, a powerful healing effect and preventive effect, that it could have such um, uh, an important effect on something so so physical as coronary heart disease. Uh, the last in the area of the research on TM I just wanted to mention because it speaks to one of the main goals of this session, which is to create a world that's peaceful and harmonious. In the Yoga Sutra, it says, Tat Sanidao Vairatiyagaha, which means in the vicinity of coherence, yoga, hostile tendencies are eliminated. Now, it's deeply part of the Vedic tradition that there is a collective consciousness and that all of us are connected on a deep level. And through the practices of yoga, and particularly the practice of meditation, it stimulates that field of collective consciousness in which we are all connected. So these technologies are predicted by the Vedic literature to have an effect to promote peace and harmony in society. So in this cutting-edge research, and there's 42 studies now that have been done in this area, some of them published in very top journals, including Yale University's Journal of Conflict Resolution. These looked at large numbers of people practicing transcendental meditation and its advanced techniques in groups. And this is a uh, slide showing a group in Washington, D.C., in one such study. And what has been found in these studies is a very significant correlation with these large groups practicing TM and reductions in crime rate, and even beyond the local area, reductions in distant conflicts and acts of terrorism, and even in war and global conflicts, depending on how large the group is. This research, though it seems to be amazing to the Western mind, is actually very much in tune with the principles of, of the Vedic literature, and it's been signed off on by leading social scientists at universities throughout the country. So if you're interested in this work, I would suggest you Google the Global Union of Scientists for Peace. Global Union of Scientists for Peace. And there's a beautiful, very nice review of that. And very quickly, at the end, uh, Ayurveda, uh, oldest conti continually practiced medical system. Uh, Ayurveda, the main principle of Ayurveda is balance of mind, body, behavior, and environment and that Ayurveda teaches us how to live in harmony with natural law, and when we do that, it wakes up the body's own internal healing mechanism. So the body has tremendous capacity for self-healing and repair. We just have to know how to live in harmony with nature. Um, 
I just, there's a lot of statistics here, like yoga, Ayurveda is growing in popularity, it's lagging a little behind the sister science of yoga. I want to give a special appreciation to Nama and Hillary's work at Nama. They have been developing professional standards for Ayurvedic medical practice that are going to become now universal, I think. Uh, many professional training programs in Ayurveda are, are coming up all across the country, including one that I'm on faculty of at Marshall University of Management, which is an accredited master's in science program, and others that are listed here. And one very encouraging trend is the inclusion of Ayurveda in curricula as part of integrated medical curricula in medical schools across the United States, and some of these are listed here. And finally, um, as a practicing physician interested in Ayurveda, one of the most encouraging things for me has been this growing body of science showing that the core principles of Ayurveda are actually corroborated by modern science. And many of these studies were done by people who have no idea that this is what Ayurveda has been saying for thousands of years. But they're coming up with these researchers if this is the first time these have been said. So the idea that there's body types or constitutional types and one has to learn how to eat and behave and exercise and tune with one's own constitution, which is a hallmark of Ayurveda, is now being scientifically verified, in, especially in genomic studies. Excellent research. Um, gut health as key to systemic wellness, to general wellness, the health of the gut and digestion originated in Ayurveda. Now everybody is talking about it. Um, vegetarian diet, I won't go into because we're going to have a separate talk on that, except to say there's a lot of good research on it. Long-term studies, many, many subjects uh, coming out that prove the benefits of vegetarian diet. Timing is everything, according to Ayurveda. We, should, we need to know that in terms of our meals, our exercise. The main meal should be at lunch. And there's three excellent studies that have come out in the literature in the past, just the past three years, that have corroborated this. Main meal at lunch, early bedtime, and rising time. So important, these simple, simple behaviors that if everyone started to do this, it would cut chronic disease, I believe, by 80%. Um, Timing of exercise. Exercise should be done in the morning. Ayurveda has said that. To the time and memorial, there's reasons for that. Modern research is showing that. And exercise should vary according to one's body type. Certain people need vigorous exercise. Certain people should not do vigorous exercise. So knowing that is so important. And then simply that interface between mind and body as a key to creating health, that ancient Ayurvedic principle. So in conclusion, the Vedic tradition of knowledge offers a broad vision of human potential for holistic living, encompassing mind, body, behavior, and environment, and ranging from the health of the individual to that of the society and the world. Modern scientific research is validating many of the core Vedic principles and practices which offer solutions to some of the most pressing problems in modern life. And I want to end with two inspiring quotes from the Vedic literature, Svasti Prajabhaya, May the good belong to all the people of the world. And this was already mentioned earlier today. Asudaiva Kutumba come. The world is my family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rothenberg. That's great. And we're going to move on to Dinesh. Where are we? Namaste. So my name is Dinesh Kashikar, but people call me Kashi. It's nicer, like this serial. <laughs> and I know I have time, uh, a little less time. Let me start with the next slide, please. So this whole topic is about holistic living, about seeing a whole world where humanity comes together, peace, harmony. It seems very idealistic. Is it at all possible? And my, my guru, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, he says very, very nicely that world peace starts with individual peace. Unless we have some peace at the level of the individual, it's not going to translate there. And like Dr. Stewart said before me, yet Pindita Tamani. The individual reflects 
in the microcosm reflects in the macrocosm. So if we start from where we are, we can get to where we need to be. Next slide, please. And the word yoga itself comes from the root yuj, which means to unite and to bring together. So uniting what? Uniting the loose ends of our existence. Maybe we are sitting here, but the mind goes somewhere else. You're wondering, lunch? Maybe that's why we all came back in so fast here. So, look, the body, mind, all of it needs to come together. And that's where our efficiencies grow. So, that's how the practices of yoga, and here when I say yoga, I include asana, pranayama, meditation as yoga. The Bhagavad Gita gives us a very beautiful framework in which to make this happen through bhakti, through jnana, through karma. And all of these facets of yoga are something that we can use to make this union happen. I'm just giving a short overview of what I'm going to be talking and then I'll plunge into the topics. And at Art of Living, what we teach is called the Art of Living, not the Art of Leaving. <laughs> which is really what the Bhagavad Gita talks about, how we can translate meditation into work as Dr. Slow very nicely put it about the different levels of yoga. And we do this using Sudarshan Kriya, which Su means proper, Darshan is vision, Kriya is action. So literally an action that can bring proper vision. So a lot of times holistic living is all about seeing the whole and not the parts. Or seeing the parts and looking into how it ties into the whole. So that's where we feel that Sudarshan Kriya is a very beautiful technique that can make this happen. Next slide, please. So this brings me to the topic, how we can look at holistic living. And the Vedas gives us a very beautiful framework, the Pancha Kosha. The Pancha Kosha talks of the whole of existence as Annamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manubhaya Kosha, Vijnanamaya Kosha and Anandamaya Kosha. Annamaya Kosha is that which is made up of food. And in a certain sense, what we see is food for the eyes, what we hear is food for the ears. So typically, you would look at the whole environment and this body as Annamaya Kosha. Pranamaya Kosha is the energy that animates this whole inanimate Annamaya Kosha. Manumaya Kosha is the mind that directs, that does all the interaction, the input and the output. I see using my eyes, but it's the mind that sees through the eyes. My hand lifts up, but it's the mind that lifts the hand. And Vijnanamaya Kosha, Vishishta Jnana, a specialized kind of awareness, knowledge, intuition. There is so much that is not, that is beyond what we see, the intellect, all of this comes under the Vijnanamaya Kosha and Anandamaya Kosha, the basis, 